Hello and welcome to Showcase, where contemporary artists get ranked, replicas of the Mona Lisa sell for millions, and one of the most powerful people in publishing sits down with me for a chat. Art Review lists the top 100 figures in contemporary art this year. Not by Da Vinci, but still in demand. Another Mona Lisa replica is up for grabs. And Hugo Setzer gives us some insight into the global trends in the publishing industry. The art world is combing over Art Review's Power 100. The rankings of the top figures in contemporary art came out last week and is filled with protesters and campaigners until you get to the top of the list. American photographer Nen Golden makes the list for her protests against the Sackler family and its alleged involvement in the US opioid crisis. A new entry to the list is the New York activist group Decolonize This Place. But critics are pondering Art Review's top choice of MoMA director Glenn Lowry. While Lowry oversaw a $450 million expansion of the museum, Art Review's editor-in-chief Mark Ruppold decried what he called a retirement-aged white American at the top in a year in which neglected discourses, histories and geographies in art have been a theme. Ben Easton joins me now. He is the co-founder of The White Review and editor of Art Review magazine. Thank you so much for joining us today. What a list. I mean, at the top, we see uh, a retirement-aged white American, MoMA director. And then, I mean, uh, the list is pretty much dominated by people who are actually protesting against the establishment in the art world. Why do you think there is this tension, this duality in the list this year? Well, I think the list certainly reflects uh, precisely those tensions between established forms of power uh, and attempts to disrupt them. Uh, as you say, it's a very predictable choice in one way to have Glenn Lowry at the top of the list. But in fact, what he's done with MoMA is, I think, begin to adapt to some of those challenges by changing the way that the collection is organized, by giving greater attention to uh, women artists, uh, to artists from different parts of the world than Europe and America, and to really reconsider what contemporary art looks like and where it comes from. So he's at the top of the list, I think, because he's responding to some of those challenges that are coming from people like Nan Golden and decolonize this place. But as you say, those tensions between power and attempt to disrupt those powers has really been a defining thing about this year's list. So was there a consensus on Glenn Lowry or was that, was that a heated debate? Well, I don't think there's ever quite a consensus. Um, it's always a debate. And it's always a question of thinking about what we're trying to, uh, what shifts we're trying to trace uh, in the way that power is organized. But I think there's no doubt that the massive reorganization of MoMA shows how some of these discussions around changing the way that art is read and understood are now making it to the biggest institutions. These aren't just, I think, um, arguments that are being uh, had amongst disruptive elements of the art world, but are actually really going right to the top. So the fact that Glenn Lowry has overseen this change, which really reconsiders the way that we think about contemporary art and about art of the past 100, 150 years, I think shows the changes that are taking place. It's really a, a kind of rubber stamp on some of those, uh, those disruptions to, to establish systems of power. I mean, systems of power is definitely a strong theme this year. When, I mean, considering canonical artists, like star artists like Marina Abramovic, Damien Hirst, uh, Anish Kapoor, they are not in the list. But then we keep talking about them all the time. Do you think they're really losing their power in the art world? I think part of power and influence as it's measured by this list is really setting the agenda. And we're trying to think about the people who are changing the way that artists are, are working or that institutions are working that are having really dramatic impacts in the future. And while, of course, there are these canonical names who are still very influential in terms of the visitor numbers they draw, it's a question of whether those people are really setting the agenda for a new generation of artists. And it's why I think we have people like Nan Golden and Hito Steil right at the top, because they're beginning to uh, create new ways of thinking about what art can be. And they're the lessons that are being taken up by younger artists. So I think it's not, the, the, the measures of power and influence are, are not simply visitor numbers and they're not necessarily 
the prices that these people command at auction. It's about who's changing the way that we think and understand art today. Is this also why we're not seeing a lot of people from the art fairs this year in the list? I think that's precisely, precisely it. Uh, art fairs, are, of course, are enormously important to the economy of, of the art world. Um, but whether they actually set the agenda, whether they uh, exhibit things that change the way we think about art, uh, is not really, I think, the case in the opinion of the jury of people who put this list together. They remain important, uh, they generate a lot of money, but whether they're setting the agenda, I don't know. And I think the same could be said for auction houses, which aren't really represented again in this list, that these uh, places, you might say, provide the money that keeps the top end going, but they're not changing the way that we think about art. And, and this idea of power and influence is really about who's changing the way that we think, who's changing the structures, who's really making a dramatic impact, not only on, on what is happening now, but what will happen in the next five years. So Ben, is this list sort of like trying to uh, spotlight to how the power structures should be like in the art world? I mean, is there an element of wishful thinking in the list? Well, I think if we were wishful thinking, it would be <laughs> a much more dramatically different list. Um, no, I think it's really an attempt to uh, faithfully uh, illuminate the structures of power that determine who gets shown, what sells where, uh, what we come to know as a general public, but also to recognize that there are challenges to those structures of power that are taking place, and they've really been dramatic over the past year and two years. And those things aren't put in purely because they're wishful thinking. They're put in because they really are changing how big institutions are operating. They're changing how commercial galleries are showing, who they're showing. Uh, and we could look at someone like Nan Golden, who with her protests against the Sacklers, has really changed the way that institutions are thinking about funding themselves. And that has really significant impacts for what is shown, uh, what the public comes to know, uh, and what contemporary art will look like for the coming years. So I don't think it's wishful thinking, but it's certainly an acknowledgement that there are these very enduring structures of power and there are people who are beginning to change them and, are, and in many cases are succeeding in changing them. So in your dream list, who would be at the top of the list? In my dream list? Uh, well, I would, I think. I'd be number one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the point of this list, and as much as that answer is a joke, it, it, the whole point is that it presents something that people can dispute. So people are always going to disagree with the list, the parameters by which they're put together. And of course, it's a, although it's quite a wide jury that contributes, it's, uh, it's still subjected to certain degrees. Um, so the point is that by presenting a list, you give something that people can argue for or against uh, and can begin to talk about these structures of power that do determine um, how the world works, what we see, what we talk about. And I think can begin to be honest about how that works to recognize that there are people with influence uh, and those people uh, have perhaps undue influence sometimes, but it's changing and it's always shifting. So hopefully it's always a point of discussion. It's a, it's a list that people can respond to and they can come up with their own, their own ideas and their own ideals. And um, one last point before we wrap up. Uh, decolonizing is definitely uh, at the forefront of the list this year as a theme itself. But then when I look at the list, I mean, in the first half of the list, for example, I could only count eight people that are not from the US mm -hmm. or Europe. So do you feel like your list is decolonized enough? No, I mean, it's something that we talk about. And again, this is the distinction between providing a real reflection on how power operates and wishful thinking. I think one of the reasons there's people like Decolonize This Place and indeed Run Grupa, uh, who are this um, Jakarta-based collective, uh, who are very important, I think, are in there is because they're challenging precisely that. But it would be remiss to pretend that there is an equal uh, division of power in the art world. That's simply not the case. Uh, America and Europe are unduly heavily represented, uh, wield an undue amount of influence. The same can be said of white men in their 50s and 60s. I think, again, this isn't about the list can't change those things, but it can draw attention to them. Uh, and I think being aware of these inequalities is the first step towards changing them. And if the list has a positive spin, it's that that awareness, that discussion is necessary in order significantly to change things, not just to talk about changing them. OK, Ben Easton, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. On this year's Power 100 is Olafur Eliasson, who was praised for his work on climate change. 
So we wanted to bring back a report we aired earlier this year about an exhibit in Portugal that tries to project how the crisis will affect the world in the not too distant future. What are we going to see when we look at our world in a few decades? That is a debate Olafur Eliasson proposes in his first ever exhibition in Portugal at Sir Halvis Museum in the city of Porto. The title plays with the words your, our, future is now. Your Our Future Is Now exhibition is a warning that the future needs to be planned now. We cannot leave it for later. Olaf Eliasson is an artist who's very concerned with important issues of our time and wants us to think over these issues by incorporating science, nature and contemporary art into his works. Urbanism, sustainability and climate change are recurring themes in Eliasson's career. The artist presents his environmental activism both inside the museum's galleries and outside, in the park area. It's this year's major exhibition, because it's an intersection of the museum itself and its surroundings, proposing a dialogue between both spaces. The yellow forest we see here in the museum atrium is almost like bringing the park inside, for example. All installations at this exhibition are fairly recent. The oldest are from 2017, and the newest were made this year. The highlight is the curious vortex, created specially for Sir Halvis. It took a team of 10 people to put this 5 meter high stainless steel pavilion together. The shape resembles a whirlwind that invites people into its 8 meter wide dome. It also works as a metaphor to the role of museums in the contemporary society. Eliasson thinks of museums as a whirlwind that has the ability to attract ideas and thoughts that can trigger change. A new attraction, opened at Sir Halvis for its 30th anniversary, coincides with the key element in Eliasson's art, nature. The treetop walk is an elevated path up to 15 meters high where visitors can admire the park from the top. Sir Halvis Park area has 18 hectares open to visitation. Treetop walk is a new perspective we are offering our public to experience. These tall, green, beautiful trees contrast with the chopped trunks visitors can find around the museum building that look as if they've been washed ashore. Those drifting woods are an installation called Arctic Tree Horizon. There are three different locations where visitors can observe these wooden pieces reclaimed by the artists from the Nordic seas. Sea currents brought these logs from Siberia to Iceland, where Eliasson collected them. By placing the trucks in foreign lands, the artist aims to address topics such as migration and also point out how connected our world is. Olafur Eliasson is a fundamental name in the contemporary arts nowadays, and it's Sir Alves' mission to bring such a personality to our museum and to Portugal. Hugo Setze is the president of the International Publishers Association, whose responsibilities go beyond his home country in Mexico. He travels from continent to continent, aiming at fostering communication between publishers of different cultures. He recently visited Istanbul, and I got the opportunity to talk to him about one of the less debated aspects of the industry, diversity. So, Hugo Setze, great to have you on our show today. Thank you so much for joining us. So, um, today I wanted to talk to you about 
diversity in publishing industry. I mean, in other parts of the arts and culture industry, like cinema, contemporary art, even music, it is a very hot topic lately, especially after Me Too. Um, do you feel like publishing industry is doing enough to sustain diversity? Um, I think we are, well, we are discussing a lot about the diversity and inclusion uh, within the International Publishers Association, and we are encouraging our members to think more about that. Um, if we are doing enough, I'm not sure. I think we have a long way still to go in terms of diversity and inclusion. We have an IPA, uh, uh, we have appointed a, a special envoy for diversity and inclusion, who is our past, uh, immediate past president, Michiel Kohlmann. And he's doing a lot on that field as well. And uh, well, we are very aware, for example, that we uh, need to have um, more, more women on our, on our executive committee. We actually have about one third of women on our executive committee, we would like to have more. And we are encouraging our members as well to work more on, on that topic. And it depends on um, every country. Every country has different approaches to that. So what do you think are the steps to be taking in regards to this? Do you think, for example, is a good idea to force publishers or make it mandatory for publishers to hire and publish uh, people of color or just female writers and female editors just for the sake of it? Do you, or do you think it would just lead to maybe like tokenism? The problem when you have to just uh, uh, follow a, a, a certain quota or, 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 or just appoint someone because you have to, uh, perhaps it's not the best person. For example, I was mentioning our vice, current vice president at, at IPA um, and next president. Is a, is a woman from the United Arab Emirates, um, Sheikh Abdul Al Qasimi. And when people ask me uh, if it's important for us that she's a woman, and I say, well, yes, it's very important. But let me mention that she's not there because she's a woman. She's there because of her talent, because of all the work she has done. And it's great that, uh, in addition, she's a woman. Mm -hmm. Do you get any resistance from publishers when you try to uh, push forward your agenda? The, uh, well, I wouldn't say that there is resistance. Uh, there are countries who are more advanced, like the UK. The UK Publishers Association has done a lot uh, uh, in that respect. And other associations are only starting to realize that it's an important topic. So it de depends very much on the country. So Hugo, you say that the UK is one of the good examples, but then I have this uh, report here, for example, saying that only 11% um, of the publishing industry's staff in the UK is um, ethnic minorities. It doesn't look that great to me, but what do you think? I think that report, I'm familiar with that report, and I think that's some, uh, something that triggered also the Publishers Association in the UK to take measures uh, uh, about that. And there was also some criticism because, I, if uh, I remember correctly, they were not only trying to uh, uh, engage and hire more people, uh, uh, minority groups and, and, and what have you, uh, in the publishing houses, but they have now an initiative to also be more diverse in what they publish. Mm -hmm. And um, I have this quote from you here. You said that there are misunderstandings and stereotypes about the Arab world, about Africa, and about Latin America when you were talking about the publishing industry. What does this mean and how does it reflect on uh, the dynamics of the industry? Um, you're very updated. I just mentioned it <laughs> a couple of days ago. Um, so yes, uh, there are um, stereotypes, I think, that uh, when sometimes uh, in, in, in the let me say it this way, in the West, we think about the Arab world, we have certain stereotypes about, and, 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 and it, has to be, it has to do also with extremism. And when you go to the Arab world and know, get to know the people and, and, and know the dynamics there, uh, it's completely different. And, 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 and so it's important. I was mentioning also in relation to something uh, the African writer Chimamanda Adichie uh, said about the danger of a single story that sometimes when there is a single story about a certain culture, you, you get a certain stereotype, and it's only a, a partial view of that society. So it's important to have other different stories as well, and to really get to know people in other places as well, in Africa, 
in Latin America. Uh, we have been doing a lot in Africa as well. And, 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 and I've been learning a lot about African publishing as well. And it's, it's really interesting what African publishers are, are doing as well. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. It was good to have you on our show. Thank you for inviting me. Some have called her a holy icon, while others think she's overrated. What's for sure is that Mona Lisa has the most famous portrait in the world. So much so, she attracts millions of visitors to the Louvre each year. But when you're such a masterpiece, even your replicas become highly desired. Another Mona Lisa clone awaits its new owner. This piece imitating Leonardo da Vinci's most celebrated painting will go under the hammer at Sotheby's in Paris. And the way that the eyes are set in the face and the way the sfumato, where Leonardo was famous for, the, actually you don't see any lines and the, and the shadows and it's all very smooth. Um, this is quite accomplished also in her hands, which you can see here and the folds of, the, of her sleeve are well done. And the face is really well done, whereas here there's a little difference, this is a bit more flat, so uh, this, is, this is more copy-like than in the original, and here the whole gaze of the, of the veal is, is different. The copy is thought to be painted 100 years after the 16th century original that represents many innovations in painting. From the subtle transitions between light and shade, to the use of landscape as background, and the striking realism of her lips and eyes. These were only some of the reasons why painters copied da Vinci in order to perfect their own technique. Petition was copying, Raphael was copying, Rembrandt was copying. They, they were all copying and um, because it was teaching them to look really look, closely look at masterworks and how other artists before them were doing their, um, their work. Um, I think um, you know, there are many copies of Mona Lisa because it was already a famous image at the time. And it still is. Loads of people visit the Louvre every day to catch a brief glimpse of the painting. It's no wonder that many disillusioned tourists have called it a miserable experience. But for those who want to skip the crowds, a copy of the painting comes in handy. That's if you're willing to pay more than $1.5 million for it. And last January, a collector paid exactly that price, even though it was 10 times more than the estimated value of the replica. So, how much will this replica go for? Totally unpredictable. Anything to do with Da Vinci, even if it's pupils, copies, followers, has, it's, it brings uh, surprises. We never know. The Louvre in Paris may have more paintings by Leonardo da Vinci than it knows what to do with. By last count, it's more than 160. But London's National Gallery alike, no, we only need one. And that's exactly what's happening with the museum's latest exhibition, marking the 500th year anniversary of the painter's death. The Virgin of the Rocks might seem like it's displayed in an Italian church from the early 16th century, but it's an illusion. Thanks to digital projectors, organizers recreated the setting for the masterpiece that it was originally intended, a church in Milan that was destroyed centuries ago. So what we do is we take the public on a journey uh, through the spaces that Leonardo was familiar with, through the landscapes he was familiar with, uh, his interest in light and optics, the church for which he painted the picture that no longer exists, and the altarpiece. We, we, we make an evocation of the original setting of the painting. So really it's a journey with Leonardo through the creation of the Virgin of the Rocks. Not only is the Virgin of the Rocks placed inside a fantasy, the piece isn't even da Vinci's first version of the painting. According to the exhibition's curator, the original work took 25 years to complete and now hangs in the Louvre. 
One of the really interesting things about Leonardo as a painter is how he makes two-dimensional form seem three-dimensional and alive. And he does that through his great studies of optics. He's someone who, at the time he's working at this painting, is understanding that we see, we see through different points. We see, we, see, we see light in different ways. And it's those optics, which are enhanced with high-tech mapping, that have revealed the different versions of the painting, which are each hidden underneath each other. So while the version of the rocks is a masterpiece and stands alone in its own exhibition, it's definitely not one of a kind. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Nilfede Kitli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.